Etty Hillesum, 1914 to 1943. Let's begin with some words from the last phases of her life. I now realise, God, how much you have given me, so much that was beautiful and so much that was hard to bear. To think that one human heart can experience so much, O oh God, so much suffering and so much love. I'm so grateful to you, God, for having chosen my heart in these times to experience all the things it has experienced. And those really are the words of a mystic. This profound gratefulness that this miracle of expansion of heart has happened in a brief life. A heart expanded to experience the depth of beauty and the depth of suffering that are just part of the reality of the world that we live in. And also to know that that is not something that any human being can make happen or will or create, but that it is sheer gift. We know Etty through her diaries and letters which were written in the last two years of her life from 1941 to 1943, when she was between 27 and 29 years old. So it was a short life. But to fill in some background that isn't given in the diaries because they are limited to two years of her life, she was born in 1914 in Holland. Her parents were both secular Jews, her mother was Russian, her father was Dutch, and she had no contact with formal religion of any sort in her childhood or in any part of her life. She never went into a synagogue or a church or a temple. So she was religiously, you might say, untutored. And that, I think, speaks to us in particular in our own time when we find so many people in that situation. She's a, a fellow traveller for perhaps more people now than in previous centuries. She had two, two brothers, Misha and Jap, and it was quite a chaotic family, I think, that she belonged to, and there were some mental health problems for both of her brothers, which left a residue of fear in Etty herself. She went to university, she was educated in law, Slavic languages, and when we meet her, you can see someone who is articulate, cultured, interested, extrovert, um, she's trying to study, to remain studying, and her desk is her favourite place to be, where she continues with her Russian language and Russian literature. She has some private pupils, she does a bit of work as a secretary to bring in a bit more money, and she has this great desire to be a writer, a famous writer, that's what she really wants to be. Her nature is passionate, intense, chaotic. She lives a sort of bohemian life. She's very familiar with uh, love affairs, serial love affairs, she would call them. Yet despite this outwardly confident and competent life, what she reports also is a mass of contradictory emotions coursing through her, swinging between fantasies of being a great writer, and then fears of disaster and her life crashing around her, her ears. And there's an undercurrent of health problems, menstrual problems, depression, stomach problems. So you see these two, this outward character and then an, the underlying currents of what's going on in this fully human person. In 1941, that's when she's 27, someone new comes into her life. And that new person is a man called Julius Speer. An interesting man, uh, 
himself of Jewish extraction from Berlin, and he's arrived in Amsterdam, where Etty is now living. He is a, a psychotherapist. He has had some um, conversation with Carl Jung, and Carl Jung certainly supported him and encouraged him in his own gifts. And he came to Amsterdam both to take uh, private clients and also to give public talks. He's quite hard to sum up. He was a, a sort of psychotherapist and a sort of all-purpose spiritual guru, you might say. And so he attracted uh, followers on both of those fronts and he had an understanding of, of the way the spiritual and the psychological could work together. And so Etty met him, we think, at a, a public meeting. It's very difficult to underestimate the importance of that meeting with that spiritual teacher and the influence that it continues, or he continues to have on her for the rest of her life. But that meeting seems to have sparked off a real awakening in her. And I'd like to begin with the very opening paragraph of her diary, where she gives words to what has happened to her. Here goes then. This is a painful and well-nigh insuperable step for me, yielding up so much that has been suppressed to a blank sheet of lined paper. The thoughts in my head are sometimes so clear and sharp and my feelings so deep, but writing about them comes hard. The main difficulty, I think, is a sense of shame. So many inhibitions, so much fear of letting go, of allowing things to pour out of me. And yet that is what I must do if I am ever to give my life a reasonable and satisfactory purpose. It is like the final liberating scream that always sticks bashfully in your throat when you make love. I'm accomplished in bed, just about seasoned enough I should think to be counted among the better lovers. And love does indeed suit me to perfection. And yet it remains a mere trifle, set apart from what is truly essential. And deep down, something is still locked away. The rest of me is like that too. I am blessed enough intellectually to be able to fathom most subjects, to express myself clearly on most things, I seem to be a match for most of life's problems, and yet deep down, something like a tightly wound ball of twine binds me relentlessly. And at times, I am nothing more or less than a miserable, frightened creature, despite the clarity with which I can express myself. Well, that's a pretty amazing start for a diary, isn't it? And clearly is a moment of insight, of self-knowledge, of realisation. A real moment of awakening. The sort of thing that comes all of a sudden out of the blue. Of course, although I'd like to, I want to call it a spiritual awakening, there is no religious language, there is no mention of God, there are no visions. <laughs> it's very much couched in the psychological language, which perhaps was becoming the common parlance of people for self-understanding in those times. But that is really the start of something very important, the start of a period of spiritual growth, which was really very fast. It happens within two years of her life. From that starting point, which is really quite um, self-absorbed, um, self-focused, self-dramatizing. In only two years' time, she can say this in her diary. I have broken my body like bread and shared it among men. And why not? They are hungry and had gone without for so long. You can hear the radical change there. How her concern for herself and her own self-absorption is dropped away. Her life is not about sorting her own problems out. 
It's about what she can be and give for others. So the diary is a, a marvellous document of the growth of faith. The word God appears very quickly after that first awakening. And it starts with, uh, again, thinking about some people in our own time, an embarrassment about even naming God. Certainly an embarrassment about kneeling in prayer. Some time ago, I said to myself, I am a kneeler in training. I was still embarrassed by this act, <laughs> she says. Yet two years later, she can say, you have made me so rich, O oh God. Please let me share your beauty with open hands. My life has become one uninterrupt, an uninterrupted dialogue with you. That last quote sounds so idyllic, doesn't it? It sounds like the sort of thing you could say if you were on a blissful summer's day on a mountain top or gazing out at the limitless ocean. But that's exactly not the sort of circumstances from which she's saying those words. Almost the opposite. We need to think just a little bit about the context in which she has found this way into the deep mystery of God. This is Amsterdam in 1941. She's a Jew. In 1940, um, Holland had fallen to the Nazis. The Jews in Amsterdam were being more and more restricted, physically restricted, only allowed to walk in certain streets, not allowed to walk in parks being restricted as to what transport they could use, having their bicycles taken away, being restricted as to what they could eat. She reports not being able to buy toothpaste. And that sort of restriction continues. The Jews then begin to be rounded up into the Amsterdam ghetto and then transported to the transit camp just outside Amsterdam, Westerbork, and finally transported on those monstrous um, trains to Auschwitz and Theresienstadt. That's the context in which she is living this life of faith. Where she can make that sort of statement at the end of her life about the beauty of God. It's as though her outer life is being squeezed and squeezed, squeezed to death. But at the same time, her inner life is in a process of miraculous transformation and expansion. It's almost as though the one has a very great deal to do with the causing of the other. The extremes of her outward circumstances are creating in this paradoxical way the conditions for this deepening and the words aren't big enough, really, of her inner life and her faith. As she tastes the reality of the ultimate beauty and goodness and truth of God, she begins to realise that it is infinite, it is indestructible, and it can still be seen through any sort of ugliness and brutality that human beings can uh, inflict on each other and on this earth. These are her words. She's speaking here from the transit camp. The misery here is quite terrible. And yet, late at night, when the day has slunk away into the depths behind me, I often walk with a spring in my step along the barbed wire and then, time and again, it soars straight from my heart like some elementary force. The feeling that life is glorious and magnificent and that one day we shall be building a whole new world. 
against every new outrage and fresh horror. We shall put up one more piece of love and goodness, drawing strength from within ourselves. So even in that situation, she can see beyond today, beyond the suffering of today. She can see that it will pass, although she doesn't know when. And if there is to be any future beyond this horror, which is worth having, it has to be built with love. Love is the only thing that can defeat this sort of atrocity and inhumanity. And we have to draw strength from within ourselves, she says. Very early on in this transformation, she recognises that it's no use looking to change others, to hope that others will stop doing what they're doing. That is not going to work. And there's no good trying to find a perfect philosophy or a perfect political system that's going to fix everything that the answers don't lie in those realms. The rottenness of others is in us too, she says. I see no other solution. I really see no other solution than to turn inward and to root out all the rottenness there. And that's exactly what she does. She makes that turn inward. And as we follow her in the diaries, we see how that begins to work in her life. She turns inward to prayer, to prayer and to meditation, taking the 20 minutes in the morning to enter into solitude and silence and to spend time kneeling. That's her gesture for prayer, kneeling on the rough coconut matting in the bathroom, as she puts it. My story, she says, is the story of the girl who learned to kneel. So prayer becomes the constant stream flowing through her life. She learns to repose in herself, as she calls it. She learns to live with herself, to live beyond herself, to come to know herself to be realistic about herself, to begin to surrender herself, to find her deep roots in herself and therefore in God. She talks of a vast silence in her that continues to grow, the silence of God. What resources does she have? She's not a church girl, she's not a synagogue girl. <laughs> but she does have resources. God has many witnesses in many places. She has Julius Spear. She turns to the Bible, especially the Psalms and the Gospel of Matthew. She looks to the great novels that she knows, which are steeped in Christianity, the great Russian novels, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, the philosophers, Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, St. Augustine's uh, Confessions, she's very fond of. She turns to the German writer Rilke. She loves Shakespeare. She knows Eckhart. So she turns to the great mystics and the scriptures and those works of literature, which are, as I said, soaked in a Christian understanding and a Jewish understanding both of life. One of the key things that she says she learns to do is to listen in, to listen into herself, first of all. It also means listening into God. But coming to understand bit by bit what motivates her actions, what's going on in her, what causes all this ill health, what causes these depressions, what causes these swings of mood. And listening into them in order to learn to let them go, to learn what she describes as uh, emotional continence. <laughs> she thinks she, 
has been suffering from emotional incontinence before. And gradually being able to not necessarily find healing for all of those underlying wounds, but to prevent them from coming centre stage and doing what she needs to do and what she's called to do. Making space for others, not simply dealing with, us, with her own stuff, of, as we would say today. A process of letting go of attachments and desires. Her words again. With each minute that passes, I shed more wishes and desires and attachments. There are moments when I can see right through life and the human heart, when I understand more and more and become calmer and calmer, and am filled with a faith in God that has grown so quickly inside me that it frightened me at first, but has now become inseparable from me. And now to work. And the great task of seeing reality more and more clearly and being able to accept it, to make room for it, whether it is ugly and horrific or whether it is beautiful. To be able to see it and say, yes, that is how it is, without those apprehensions being crowded out with a host of emotions that get in the way of clarity and action. And that inner work we see so clearly makes it increasingly possible for her to do this sort of thing in her life. To sit more lightly to her own concerns, her own suffering and her own desires and have the room to turn to the needs of others. To do that listening in, not just for herself, but to others to be able to read their hearts, to be able to bring them solace, to try and find a room in them for the great tenant God. And to live out her determination not to hate, which in those circumstances seems to me, <laughs> I have no words for it not to hate, to learn what love is and how to live it in apparently impossible situation. And all this is tested to the extremes in the transit camp in Westerbork, no more so than when her parents and her brother are rounded up and brought there too, and she finds herself looking after her own parents in that desolate place. Is she tempted to give up, to give way? Of course she is, time and time again. I sometimes feel like quietly packing my rucksack and getting on the next train to the east. But enough. It's not right for a human being to take the easy way out. But she is packed on that train on that train to Auschwitz on the 7th of September, 1943. And her death is recorded on the 30th of November. 